My fellow patriots, happy Tuesday. On this day in Ho history, the Slut Walk was formed. We will be taking a look back on how that came about. Plus, later on in the show, Buckingham Palace dropped the shock announcement that King Charles has cancer. And I have some advice for Meghan Markle. And also, I want to say fully that I now subscribe to the idea that the creators of The Simpsons are visiting us from the future because they have once again accurately predicted our dystopian future. All that and more today coming up on Candace Owens. You know, it hasn't yet been added to my bio anywhere, not on Wikipedia, but I am, in fact, I think a hoologist. You can just make that term up and do whatever you want now. That's the great thing about becoming a, a therapist. Everything becomes a study of, you can be a sexologist. So why can't I be a hoologist? I study this, but I'll tell you why this is on my mind, this particular slut walk. Well, when we covered Sexy Red and we went into the history, uh, rather the history, read the present of how her music has become so mainstream, somebody commented on YouTube we stopped shaming women for being hoes, and Kim K, Cardi, and Nikki all become idols for young girls. Sexy Red is just a product of that. I'm struck by that first part of the sentence. We stopped shaming women for being hoes. And that's really true. I just paused and I went, that definitely is what happened. When did it happen? Certainly in the last 10 years. When I was growing up, I'm not suggesting that there weren't hoes and there weren't whores and there weren't prostitutes, but we certainly recognize that this was not something admirable, that we shouldn't aspire to be as whole-like in our individual capacities as women. And we definitely would have shamed someone if they got on a platform. I grew up you know, in the 90s. Somebody got on a platform and was like, no, be a slut, be a slut. We would have all said, that's insane. Why would we encourage women to act like sluts? Obviously, nothing good can come from that. But suddenly everything has changed and our culture has become largely pornographic, right? And so I tried to think about what moment, when, when did it happen? When did we go over the hill, so to speak, or rather off of the mountain? I just was thinking about the slut walk. The slut walk, it came out of nowhere. Suddenly women were attending these marches and we were being told by the media that this was empowering. And I thought, how insane that they could actually name something the slut walk and then try to sell to us that this is perfectly okay and perfectly acceptable. Truly, truly bizarre. I'm going to show you some photos here of the, I would say, rather eponymous slut walk. Look at this. You can see this, these, these women, and they are touching the derriere of one another because that's what you do. One is dressed like a sexy cop. There's a reason for that. We'll get to it a little bit later. Here's another photo. We have a woman with her breasts out and something covering it. And she, is, she looks really happy, I have to say. She's got the words slut painted just above her chest. And she's got her hands up like somebody just scored a touchdown in the Super Bowl. She's really happy to be a slut. This, this actually was the Super Bowl for her hoes, I would say. I said the slut walk was a Super Bowl for sluts. And of course, as I mentioned, the media then tried to convince us that this was a good thing. And how they always do this is they put a celebrity, right? They put a celebrity face to it and they start trying to tell us that this celebrity is a hero for picking up this cause. The person that they chose was Amber Rose. She very much became the face of the slut walk. Now, I want to be clear because Amber Rose is normally associated with hip hop culture that actually at this time, black women were saying, we want nothing to do with this. And when you look back on the photos, it is a majority of white women that were celebrating in this capacity. And, white, and black women were saying in a lot of these articles that these words are not good words. We should not be using them and we would like to abstain from it. But let's look at the headlines pertaining to Amber Rose anyway. Daily Beast tells us Amber Rose, hip hop's Joan of Arc, right? So they were already going, we are going to sell this to the black community. We want them to pick up ho culture even more so than it has been picked up. Time Magazine, wow, what do you have to do to, to be in Time Magazine? Something great. Apparently not. They wrote an article called Why Amber Rose Decided to Reclaim the Word Slut. And of course, they assign her much glory all throughout the page. 
Next up, MTV News. Amber Rose tells us why her slut walk is the ultimate feminist movement. Oh, there we go. We've got an ism. If you're a feminist and you care about equality between men and women, then you should obviously be embracing the slut walk. Come down, get naked, and celebrate with us. Woohoo! Cosmopolitan, obviously, quickly behind them. Gorgeous, empowering photos of Amber Rose's slut walk. Did you feel empowered? Do you feel like the photos I just showed you were gorgeous? I'm just asking the question that everybody else wants to ask. Obviously, the answer to that is no. There was nothing gorgeous. There was nothing empowering. It was obviously the denigration of what it means to be a woman. I don't find any of those women that we just saw particularly attractive, but they did it no less because they heard the call. So you're probably wondering how Amber Rose explained this, right? She's now the face of this movement. What did she say in retrospect to convince other women that, no, actually, this is a noble pursuit? Well, she sat down to speak with Tyrese Gibson, and here's what she said. I did not invent the slut walk. The slut walk started in 2011 in Toronto, where a woman was sexually assaulted on a college campus. Mm. The police officer then went to the school and said, listen, you girls can't be dressing like sluts and think that men Ooh. ain't going to touch you and want to rape you. Mm -hmm. So obviously the girls are like, how how you going to blame me mm. for what I got on? Like, blame him. He's mm. the one that sexually assaulted me. Ooh, if women's splaining was a person, it would be Amber Rose. Because that was some lady splaining, if I've ever heard it. The takeaway you're supposed to imagine is that, yeah, that... Some girl got raped and then a police officer showed up and was like, stop being a slut. And by the way, if that's how things went down, that would be pretty outrageous. It sort of boggles the mind that any police officer would be so stupid as to say to a rape victim, stop drop dressing like a slut. So, of course, that's not what happened at all. That's the whole point of feminism. You're supposed to be really emotional. You're supposed to get um, impacted by an emotional story and then react to it without thinking and not demand further details. So I decided to actually look into further details about what this police officer said that launched this entire movement in Toronto. So here's what actually happened. On January 24th, 2011, a Toronto police officer, Michael Sanguinetti, that actually is true, and another officer from the 31 Division spoke on crime prevention. Now, they did not travel to the campus to speak about any particular person's rape. In fact, this was a normal protocol. They routinely visited this campus to talk about crime prevention as an overarching topic, not focusing on rape or anything else. But when they got to the issue of campus rape, they said, Tons of ways in which women, of course, again, this is a crime prevention seminar, could take steps to prevent being in circumstances in which you might attract somebody who is a pervert. And speaking quite loosely, Sanguinetti interrupted the more senior officer and said, I've been told that I'm not supposed to say this. However, women should avoid dressing like sluts in order not to be victimized. <gasps> Horror. Shock because we've all been trained to believe that that's victim blaming. And that's what these women said. This is, you're blaming victims if you say that there's anything that we can do to stop becoming victims. But slow down that logic. Of course, there are things that we can do every single day to prevent us, our, ourselves, from becoming victims. Let me ask you a question. Why do you lock your car and roll up the windows when you go into a store? Why not just leave them, all, leave them down and, and leave your cash in the car? Why don't you do that? Oh, because again, I have cash in the car and the window's down. It might attract a person that wants to rob me. Yeah, that's kind of common sense because people that are perverts and people that want to commit crimes obviously will see that as a bait. Hey, wh why are parents encouraged to watch their children when they take them to the playground? Why watch? Why keep an eye on your kids at all? It's a playground. Oh, because we understand it's not a utopia. We understand that perverts exist. We have heard the stories of circumstances when children are not being watched by their parents at all and a child gets snatched. Now, do we say, oh, that's victim blaming when that happens? No. We say, obviously, we should all take basic safety measures to ensure that we do not become victimized because the world is filled with criminals, becoming more so now because we've gotten so soft on crime in America. So, yeah. That's what really happened. And 
Could he have said it in a kinder way? Sure. But one way in which you can avoid getting raped is not dressing half naked and walking down a street at 2 a.m. in the morning with no one with you. I mean, I don't know. Is everybody upset with me for saying what is so obviously true? But one thing Amber Rose did say here that was honest was that she did not start the slut walk. Because after that circumstance happened in Toronto, there were two young women that started the slut walk. And by the way, if you want to know how successful these women are, slut walk is now transnational. There are slut walks in Asia, Europe, Australia, Latin America. This took off. These women were so powerful in their delivery of this message that we cannot victim blame and we must be allowed to dress like sluts at all times that it's been taken up everywhere. So who are these women? Let's do a little history. Who are these women that had this much of an impact? Well, the first woman's name is Sonia Barnett. Sonia Barnett is herself a Canadian, and I'm going to read you her bio. Color you shocked when I tell you that she is a registered psychotherapist with a passion for sex therapy. Of course, she's a psychotherapist, right? This is what's happening. Psychology has become a joke, and people who are psychologists are inducing these jokes on our culture. She also writes that I'm also a multiple award-winning feminist porn producer. Ah, of course she is. She's a pervert. (laughs) That's exactly what she's saying. I'm actually a pervert. And she's also a certified intimacy coordinator. Obviously, that probably has something to do with the production of porn, showing people how they can have sex on camera, and she prides herself on these things. And by the way, you're not going to be surprised necessarily to learn that she also lists herself as a part of the, and I'll read it from her bio, LGBTQIA2S plus community. Yes, two as in the number, S plus community. I didn't know that we were now adding numbers to this. I mean, it's giving me dyslexia at this point. Don't care to find out what that means. And that she is sex, work, polyam, and kink friendly, utilizing rack principles. Yep, sex, work, polyam, and kink friendly. So again, she's a pervert. And she wants you to know she is. She's not hiding in plain sight. Her partner there, Heather Jarvis, from her bio, Heather Jarvis is a queer, of course, sex and body positive feminists. And she has experience in gender studies. Oh my gosh, who could have imagined? Social work. And she initiates projects around gender equality, sexual education, and supporting marginalized communities. In 2009, Jarvis founded the Keyhole Sessions as a safe and welcoming community for artists to experience the marriage between sex and art. Yes, you guys, understand this. Pornography is art now, so just accept it. If you don't like looking around you and seeing everybody naked and people marching down the streets naked, that's your fault because therapists and people that are body positive, queer, sex, and gender equality people insist that this is the way that we should do it. This is the way forward. Obviously, everything that's happening in America is great, so why not embrace more pornography? She also lists in her bio as a last sentence, which is very funny, that she's an activist and advocate for sex positivity. She's got a clean conscience, conscience, but a filthy mind. Those are her words. A clean conscience, but a filthy filthy mind. I'm a pervert. I'm a pervert. I'm a pervert. But keep platforming me. Give me TED Talks. Let me talk about my perversions. And somebody obviously is funding that. There obviously is some sort of pornographic conspiracy theory happening in America. There's no way that something this ridiculous, something so in our faces, something entitled the slut walk could gain this much power transnationally if it was not being a well-funded effort, which brings me closer to my conspiracy theory that there is a well-funded effort to collapse America from the inside. I really do believe that. Um, But I will leave you with this because the good news is that we do have some comedians who are willing to call this out and to signal to women how ridiculous us having accepting this narrative that pornography and sex and being a slut is good. It's ridiculous. And one of those comedians is, of course, Dave Chappelle. Take a listen to what he had to say when covering this topic. The girl gets mad and says, oh, uh-uh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Just because I'm dressed this way does not 
make me a whore. Gentlemen, that is true. Just because they dress a certain way doesn't mean they are a certain way. Don't ever forget it. But ladies, you must understand that that is confusing. Now that would be like me, Dave Chappelle the comedian, walking around the streets in a cop uniform. Somebody might run up on me. Oh, thank God. Officer, help us. Come on, they're over here. Help us. I'm like, oh, just because I'm dressed this way does not make me a police officer. Fine, you are not a whore. But you are wearing a whore's uniform, I'll tell you that <laughs> What could I say I agree? Maybe necessarily you guys are not all hoes, but a lot of you are wearing the uniform. And that's all I'm going to say about that. If you're like me, there's not a day that goes by that you don't call or text somebody that you care about. And my friends at Pure Talk are making it easier, plus more affordable, to connect with the most important people in your life. Pure Talk gives you phenomenal coverage on America's most dependable 5G network. It's the same coverage that you know and love, but for half the price of the other guys. With unlimited plans started at just $20 a month, the average family saves almost $1,000 a year. A veteran-owned company, Pure Talk raised $10 million toward veterans' debt last year alone. What's more, Pure Talk's customer service team is located right here in the U.S., and they can help you make the switch in as little as 10 minutes. I challenge you to stand with the company that champions your values today. Go to puretalk.com slash Owens, and right now, you'll save an additional 50% off your first month. That's puretalk.com slash Owens to save on wireless with a company that you can be proud to spend your money with. Again, puretalk.com slash Owens. Okay, now it's time for some topics du jour. But before we get into our first topic, you know what I'm going to say. I want to remind you guys to hit subscribe to this channel. I can see you. I see everything. I see you watching for a lot of foreign countries. Hit subscribe. We're on the race to 3 million. All right, so I don't know what to say here. I guess I'll just start by saying that I had more hope for humanity. I really did. I remember when I was seeing photos, actually it was one particular photo, it was of Mark Zuckerberg. He was testing VR glasses. I, I don't know if it was at some conference. And this was the photo, let me just show it to you. I thought, this looks like a dystopian nightmare. The way that he's smiling, he always looks evil. There's something about him that he just looks like he's gonna turn into an alien. His skin is just going to fall off. And then all of these people that look like slaves. He's like, yes, this is the slave culture that I want going forward. Technology will enslave the masses. So evil. But he wasn't the first person that predicted this. No, I think that he might have just been the visionary that said, can we make this real? Of course, it's always the Simpsons. I don't know how it happens. There's a conspiracy theory that the people who wrote The Simpsons are from the future because everything that they wrote that was so obscure at the time has somehow become true. They notoriously had Donald Trump coming down an escalator decades ago, announcing his run for president, and then he came down an escalator and announced his run for president. And yes, they also had a vision regarding these VR glasses. Take a look. Ah! No way, viewers said at the time. No way are people just going to be commuting to work, walking into walls, wanting to engage in this fake reality rather than look out and perceive real reality. That just can't happen, except it is happening. Here is a person presumably commuting to work the other day on the subway. I got to say, that guy, confident. I'm not confident enough to look that crazy. And uh, we had covered, actually, the VR glasses. I talked about how strange it was. I tried them just once, and it was terrifying because it did seem like it was reality. I was afraid to jump on this off of this fake elevator, even though, obviously, I knew I was safe in reality, in my real world. I did not want to jump, and I refused to do it because I sensed that the doom was the fake reality that was being created by the VR goggles. Again, very dystopian to think that people will begin to pick this up. We are becoming enslaved by our technology. There's no question about it. 
I guess the bigger question would just be who's benefiting from that enslavement, right? So I'm hoping that this brave person on the subway is not going to be the average person and that we aren't going to see the majority of people that are commuting and walking with their VR glasses. I'm hoping that we can return to some sort of sanity, which means that it's incumbent upon us parents to not allow our children to experiment with this sort of technology. But also, I do want to remind you guys that shame works. Just look at people, laugh at them, and be like, what on earth are you doing? Even though in this circumstance, they wouldn't be able to see you because they're wearing their goggles and they're in a different world. All right, guys, moving away from that topic, but also perhaps another reminder to raise your children correctly, and I'll tell you why I am saying that. King Charles, very sad announcement coming out of Buckingham Palace yesterday. He has been diagnosed with cancer. Now, essentially, the shock announcement dropped, and here is what we know so far. The 75-year-old monarch was diagnosed with a type of cancer. They were not clear about what type of cancer it was. They found it after tests regarding a separate issue following the enlargement of his prostate treatment. And so, yes, they're not saying explicitly that he has prostate cancer. He's traveling back to London, and he's going to start treatment immediately. Now, they have said that he is hopeful about the prognosis. Obviously, you never know if that's true or not. And I, what I would say is that he has suspended all of his public-facing duties, which would, you know, signal to the public that it is quite serious. And we are, of course, wishing him well on this treatment. Something else that was mentioned uh, in the press yesterday was the fact that he immediately called all of his family members and that we are expecting that Prince Harry is going to fly immediate to, immediately to London to be by his father's side, as he should. That part, you know, I, I think the media is hopeful for a reunion, that they will come together. To me personally... Wanting to reunite with your family because they are dying is, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. I guess I'll just ask you, how do you, how do you feel about that? You know, we watched what happened in this family. We watched how one woman was able to convince via really an act of witchcraft, her husband to fund the lifestyle that she's always wanted as an A-lister because she didn't have the talent to turn her into an A-list celebrity. She launched onto a, uh, rather lunged onto a prince and deluded him into selling his family for profit. That is what Prince Harry did. There's no other way to look at it. He sold his family for profit. Profit. It was not about freedom. It was not about finding freedom. It was not about talking about racism and taking down the institution. It was about funding his wife's expensive taste and getting her into the parties that she's always wanted to be in. I want to be best friends with Oprah. I want to be best friends with the elites in Hollywood. I was never invited to these parties as a D-list actress, and you are going to get me there. And she plotted and she thought about how to do that. And she found an opportunity with the Black Lives Matter movement and the public sentiments at the time to convince people that the barely black looking she was somehow suffering from racism inside of the institutions so that people wouldn't see actually what we were watching was the narcissistic psychology of a woman who was hell bent on becoming an A-lister. That's it. It's narcissistic personality disorder. There was a lot of that going around Hollywood. And so what I would say to Meghan Markle is to just stay away. Just stay away. I guess at some point in the future, you guys will run out of money because you're not making any money because you don't have any talents outside of saying horrific things about somebody's father, that person being King Charles, you guys insinuating that he was a racist, somehow getting that leaked in the press by accident by your friend, Omid Scobie, if that's how you even said it, Omid Scobie, who cares? He's also a jerk, right? Because who would want to be a part of this? Who would want to support a person that was quite literally becoming wealthy by selling out their own family? So you have King Charles, who in his late age, at 75 years old, right? He's already outlived the average life expectancy for men, who had to deal with this, being called a racist, having the public speculate that he was a racist because he perhaps made an offhanded comment uh, quickly about, oh, I wonder what color the, the child, the baby will be. I say that every single time I have a kid. I got some super white looking kids and some darker kids because that's what happens when you come together as a mixed family. But you villainized him. And in the same way that you villainized the queen before she died, 
the two of you, in my view, are a couple that has engaged in types of elder abuse to line your own pockets. Because if it was really about fighting racism, if it was really about finding freedom, you wouldn't have signed a $100 million deal to do it. You would have just said it. Anyways, enough about that. Stay away, Megan. Moving on and relatedly, what we're really talking about here, if you think about Megan embracing racism and, and BLM or what we talked about earlier in the show regarding the feminist movement, it, they always wave the flag of progress, right? When so obviously what is happening in the United States is regression. And I think that is why there has been this sort of revolt that's taking place in America. Even if it's not a boots on the ground revolt, I would definitely say we're in the midst of a revolutionary when it comes to our minds. We, we wanna know what's actually happening. None of this is making sense. And that is obviously the interest that people are having when it comes to wanting to see what Putin and Tucker discuss, right? That's why the mainstream media is losing their mind because they're there to convince you that everything that's happening in America is great. It's about freedom, it's about progress. When you so obviously are looking around like me and going, no, none of this is good. How can we possibly think it's good? So a lot of clips now are circulating of speeches that Putin has given recently that have obviously never been aired in our, main, our mainstream media because we engage in propaganda over here just like they engage in propaganda over there. This particular speech caught my eye. I think I'm gonna leave it to you as food for thought. So take a listen, and in case you are listening on the audio, I will summarize for you what he is saying, because he's obviously not in English. Take a listen. Просто чудовищных вещах, когда детям сегодня с малолетства внушают, что мальчик легко может стать девочкой, и наоборот, фактически навязывают им якобы имеющийся у каждого выбор навязывают, отстраняют этого родителей, заставляя ребенка принимать решения, способные сломать ему жизнь. И никто не, даже не советуется с детскими психологами. Вообще, ребенок в каком-то возрасте в состоянии принимать решения подобного рода или нет? Навязывая, называя вещи своими именами, это уже просто на грани преступления против человечности. И все под именем и под знаменем прогресса. So we discussed earlier how the feminist movement has now locked arms with trans ideology. We mentioned Heather Jarvis, a member of the queer community who also does a lot of work to make sure that trans rights are something that is mainstreamed in the public. I would say it is mainstream in the public. It's why we can barely talk about the trans topic today on this show beyond me just telling you what Putin says in that particular speech. But it begs the question, why, right? It beggars belief that we would be at this moment in American history. So what Putin is saying there is, quote, it's simply a monstrous moment when children are pushed to believe from early on that a boy can easily become a girl and vice versa. They are pushed to believe they have a choice imposed while parents are swept aside and a child is forced to make a decision that can break their life. He complained that no one even consults child psychologists on whether a child of a certain age is able to make these kinds of decisions. Calling a spade a spade, that is close to a crime against humanity, dressed up in the name and under the flag of progress. Well, I don't know if it's considered a crime against humanity. I do know it is considered a crime on YouTube, but what he is saying there regarding the laws that have been passed, the legislation that has been passed, the policies that have been passed uh, that target parents, yeah, that is very real. Obviously, we've covered stories where parents have had their children quite literally taken away from them from the state for refusing to affirm them in new genders. And obviously, we had on a young woman who spoke about that transition process. Now, that transition process ultimately led with Brianna having his penis removed, and he talked about the horrors of that procedure. But yeah, as I said, all of this is just food for thought. You can surely understand why the mainstream media does not want that interview between Tucker and Putin to air at all. Lent, the 40 days leading up to Easter, starts on Ash Wednesday, February the 14th. This is a time of intense prayer, fasting, and giving. Hallow's annual Pray 40 Challenge is one of their most popular. Last year, over 1 million people joined. This year's Pray 40 Challenge focuses on surrender and includes meditations on the powerful book, He Leadeth Me. This is a story about a priest who became a prisoner and slave in the Soviet Union during the Cold War. 
His story is one of ultimate surrender, and we are called to offer up our own worries, anxieties, problems, and lives to God. There will also be Lent music, Lent-specific Bible stories, and other Lenten prayers, like the seven last words of Christ with Jim Caviezel. Hallow is truly transformative and will help you connect with your faith on a deeper level. So download the Hallow app today at hallow.com slash Candice. That's hallow.com slash Candice for an exclusive three-month free trial of all 6,000 plus prayers and meditations. All right, guys, we are up against the time here. I'm going to try to get to a couple of your comments. These were regarding women complaining about working 40 hours a week. Catalina writes, I 100% agree with you, Candace. Being a mom is the most rewarding job I could have had. I was in the corporate world for 10 years before becoming a mom, and I somewhat felt like that girl on TikTok, felt no satisfaction in what I was doing day in and day out. I feel like I have now found my calling. I feel accomplished. Yes, that is why I didn't want to make fun of that girl, even though tons of people were making fun of her, because what she is speaking to is what she doesn't understand. You know, she's going, why is this happening to me and why should she understand it? That was decided for her by feminists of the past and obviously to great benefit of the government. We can now tax, tax, tax households much more than we had ever imagined. And then we can send that money overseas and tell everybody that they can't ask any questions about where it's all going. Cloflake writes, I am 23, married, and I have one child with one on the way. I was told by my family that I needed a full-time job before I got pregnant with my first just to, quote-unquote, have that under my belt. I was so confused. Why do they not want me to be a mom? Why did I need to get a job when my husband can support our family just fine? Now I am working about four to 10 hours a week, something I am so incredibly grateful for. But as time goes on, my motivation to work is lessening. I want to clean my house, cook my family meals, and be there for my children. Whether they are taking naps or not, I do not want to work even these short hours. So when my second child is born, I plan on submitting my letter of resignation. Chloe, I love that. I wish that the media showed more examples of that, of women that are happy at home, because we have gotten the exact opposite messaging, the exact opposite messaging, and that has been ever intentional because it has allowed government to grow itself. Again, I am not saying that every woman needs to quit their job, that every woman is miserable at their job, and that every woman should instead go take care of children, but I am saying that it is my belief that the overwhelming majority of women are absolutely miserable at work, and they're scared to say so because, well, Feminism, the feminist lobby has brainwashed them and reality is now meeting up with that. All right, guys, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for today, but we will be back tomorrow with a brand new episode. I'll see you then.